Hi and welcome everybody. This is the Hobo Prepper and today I am interviewing Mr. John DeCarmine. Say hi Mr. DeCarmine. Hello everybody. Okay, kind of give us, what is your role? What is it that you do here at Grace Marketplace? Uh, so I'm the executive director of Grace. Grace is a one-stop homeless assistance center, a low barrier emergency shelter. We provide 129 beds of emergency shelter, meals through Cafe 131, uh, got a really great street outreach program that takes the best of our services to people who can't or won't come into shelter, and then we operate permanent housing programs throughout Gainesville too. Okay, can you define to us what is a low barrier shelter? Yeah, low barrier shelters, so it's acknowledged to be the best way to provide services. And um, thinking about the way other shelters have been provided in, or other shelter has been provided in years past, there was a lot of programs that tried to make people fit the needs of the program in order to allow them receive, to receive services. And what low barrier shelters do pretty simply is we make sure that our programs fit the needs of the people that we're actually trying to serve rather than trying to force people into uh, certain roles or boxes that, that may not be natural for them. So to, to put it in not too many words, we try to make it as easy as possible for people to access our services and try to make sure that there are no barriers that would prevent somebody from coming in and getting help. Okay, so, I mean, you have all these different unique people with each person has their own unique needs. How do you put together services that will allow you to uh, service the most uh, doing the least harm? That's a great question. Um, and, you know, there have been times we went fully low barrier in 2016. We were never particularly high barrier. Um, high barrier is going to be a place that says something like, hey, in order for you to come in, we're going to require sobriety or identification, which is really easy for people to lose, or uh, that you have income or that you have a job and things like that. And we often talk about it in terms of, you know, imagine if you called the doctor and the doctor said, hey, as soon as you're not sick anymore, come on into my doctor's office and we'll take care of your problems. That's what I see a lot of, of high barrier shelters doing, you know. Um, if you have been sober for 30 days and you have a job and you have connections in the community and you don't have any other issues, well, then you really don't need our help. So if you can already do all of those things, that's not when you should be coming into a homeless shelter. It's when you haven't been able to sort that stuff out. So as far as how we do that for, you know, how do you craft a giant program that meets the individual needs of people who all have different needs? It's, it's, it's a little bit difficult. You know, we... Low barrier is not the same as saying there are no rules here. You know, low barrier simply means um, we don't want to prevent you if we don't have to from receiving any services here. So what low barrier looks like on a daily basis is we just have some basic expectations around health and safety, uh, but we're not trying to do any kind of healing or fixing or behavioral control or anything like that. So the, the answer is you can have done anything leading up to when you arrive at Grace, but your ability to continue to receive services here will basically be determined on, um, on, on your behavior and how you show up in this collective and communal setting. Okay, so you were saying, I, I heard you say something there about not helping with like the behavioral health and stuff like that. That seems to be the primary problem amongst homeless. So why leave that out but take care of everything else? It's not that we're not helping with behavioral health, it's that we're not policing people's behavior. Okay. So what that might look like, you know, this morning somebody is, everybody here is in crisis, first of all. To understand that is critically important. So if we're serving 200 people a day, um, I have been at shelters where if you call the director a bad name because you're frustrated, you get banned. I have been in shelters where if you have alcohol on your breath, you get banned for six months. Or if you forget to say please or thank you. Or if you slam a door because you're in the middle of the worst crisis of your life and you're having a particularly bad day, you know, we don't believe that that is a reason to tell somebody you don't deserve help. You know, I think it's very natural that somebody's in the midst of a really bad crisis and they're going to get frustrated. They, and they may take that out on the copy machine. They may take that out on the executive director. They may take it out on a door. You know, at some point... There's a line between, hey, you're frustrated and I get that, and what you're doing is creating an environment that's unsafe for other people to be in, but we're going to work with people, and even when people first kind of push up against that line, 
there's an opportunity for us to de-escalate that person to help them kind of come back into what's expected here as opposed to immediately finding an example or a reason for them not to be allowed to receive help. Okay. Um, so uh, Grace Marketplace also subscribes to a housing first policy. That's correct, right? Correct. And isn't that something that was adopted from the Netherlands? Um, they were kind of the ones that pioneered it? As I understand it, and I, I may be off a little bit in my, my historical knowledge of it, I believe that model came out of the Northeast um, from late 80s to the early 90s through a group called Pathways to Housing, uh, where they were looking initially at psychiatric patients on the street who had been told previously, you know, as soon as you solve your psychiatric problems, then you get housing. And what they started to do is say, well, gosh, what if we gave people housing first? And it turns out it's much easier for them to start solving their psychiatric problems once they have housing. Regardless of where it would have originated, I know it's certainly been adopted much more quickly in the Netherlands, uh, where there's a, a much stronger social safety net. So there's been some really good research showing how effective the program is out of there. But if it came from there, I'm not 100% sure. And how how is Grace Marketplace implementing the housing first? Because I, I see people going in and out just through my travels through here, but it seems like mostly the people that have a, that get a check are the ones that are getting the housing. Whereas my understanding of housing first is it doesn't matter whether you get a check or not, you should have a roof over your head so that you could uh, so that you can start getting that check and getting your stability. Sure. So like, like, how is Grace Marketplace uh, accomplishing this goal with their Housing First program? Yeah, so so people are going to have access to different kinds of programs um, depending on their need. And, you know, people love to think about homelessness as if there's one solution for everybody. And in some ways there is. I mean, housing is the only thing that's going to actually solve somebody's homelessness. But... If you look, you know, within the homeless population, the, the group of folks that you're talking to may have some needs that are as serious as kind of like if you came into the emergency room having a heart attack, some people have some needs that are a little bit more in line with like showing up to the emergency room having broken your arm, you know, totally different sets of responses that you would need. Um, in our shelter, you know, it's implemented in a couple different ways. One, we're entirely housing focused. So... Um, again, other shelters, you may have a case manager who spends 20% of their time talking to a person about employment and 20% talking about their health and 20% of their time talking about, you know, issues with other people and 20% of this and only 20% of the time are they talking about housing. We bring in a lot of different service providers who can handle a lot of those things. So instead of us talking to people about employment, Career source would come in and talk to people about employment. Instead of us trying to talk to somebody about physical health care or mental health care, we've got the mobile outreach clinic here. We've got the Grace Healthcare uh, Services Corporation here. We've got Meridian here to do some basic stuff around mental health or physical health care because we're not going to be good at that. We'll never be as good at that as, as a doctor who comes here to do that. So one way that this is implemented is that we're very focused on housing with an understanding that it's the only solution to homelessness. All of our programs, uh, particularly our rapid rehousing programs and our permanent supportive housing programs, you can get into them if you're qualified and the next person to be eligible for it, um, regardless of if you have income, regardless of anything other than you've just got to be willing to work with us to stay in that housing. Um, but then, you know, Housing First runs up against the reality of we can have the coolest program philosophies in the world, but unless we're the ones paying the rent for a unit, people are going to have to have some kind of income. So there are still always going to be people who we are working with, whether that's to get a social security check, a disability check, or basic, more traditional paid employment income, because the reality is if we're not the ones paying the rent for a unit, somebody's got to pay the rent for a unit. And our, and our goal then becomes, how can we help you find an affordable unit? Maybe can we connect you with a roommate that would cut your costs in half, whatever else. But that's another route that we would take with people in the shelter. You know, something that I see, everybody always seems, to, oh, you need four walls uh, around you. But housing isn't necessarily four walls. I mean, in my tent before it came up missing, uh, in my tent, that was my sanctuary. That was my four walls. That was my housing. That was what kept me dry. Sure. 
why, I mean, even though you're, you don't have the shelter capacity for the population, even though you're trying to get people into housing as best as you possibly can, um, why is there not a secondary focus on this is also considered housing so that people can at least have some form of stability even if they're not getting a check or getting disability so that they can get to that point for disability or to get a traditional check? You're asking about, you know, why is there not some recognition that like a tent could also be stability or housing? Is that, am I understanding in, you correctly? In some ways, yes, because I mean, you know, again, like, before they ran us out of the forest, or even if they didn't run us out of the forest, if there was like a, a tent community to where I could set up a tent, that is still housing because I have a place to keep my stuff dry and I have you know, a place to put my stuff where it's out of the view of other people, which gives me the sense of security sure. for my gear. Um, and, and it seems like most people are more focused on, well, you just need four walls. Well, there's not enough four walls just because of, of the design of the capitalistic system and scarcity, so you have to be able to provide another solution. Why is tents not part of that solution? Well, so a couple things. One, um, we always want to be careful because the more, the closer we get to letting people define some human beings living in a tent as housing, the closer we get to creating this like entirely separate class of housing that we say, well, you know, Wealthy people get four walls and poor people get walls made out of vinyl or, you know, whatever tent walls are. And I want to be really careful that we don't. We, yes, I agree with you. There's some stability around a tent. One of the issues, though, that you just brought up is it was entirely stable until it wasn't until somebody just ran you out of the land. You know, we've spent a lot of time trying to run um, a, a tent community here. And, and actually, I'll tell you what, we, we as a community, I would say probably spent less time trying to run it well and more times just dealing with the problems that had popped up from it not being run well. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's some, some exploration there that, that would stand to figure out like, hey, how do we allow people to live in a tent community, recognizing that it's safer, recognizing that it is more stable and that's going to have some benefits as well. Um, Overall, though, you know, I, I want to see people who are not going through hurricanes in a tent. I want to see people who are not going through the coldest parts of winter in a tent. And, and if there's a way that we can do that, then we would need to consider it. For us, it's not so much that I think it's a horrible idea. It's just that, you know, what Grace can do and what Grace is funded to do and what we have the staff to do is a very limited portion of services and we're already doing a lot between shelter and outreach and housing programs what we have found is that to run a program like that well it's not something you just do in your spare time and it requires additional people who are staffing that could be people who are living there who are part of the staff there um, needs people to guide what happens next again probably best that it's people who are living there to do that but at the end of the day we have also seen that if you just leave it to run on its own, then it's not too long before other people come in to take advantage of the people who are living there. Makes sense. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of predators out here, um, especially church groups. Um, all right, so let's let's kind of get into infrastructure because you kind of started talking about sure. this. Uh, now, I've done a little bit of research. So from what I was reading in a news article is – uh, because this is county property, they can't run it themselves. They have to run it out to a third-party entity, which is where Grace Marketplace comes in. Um, and then you guys, th there seems to be a big conundrum. Can you, can you kind of explain to us how, how something like that works? And if somebody wanted to do that within their community, what are the benefits and what are the disadvantages of doing it this way versus just having your own property? Yeah, so, so uh, let me just sort of straighten out a couple things here. So when this is city property, not county property. Oh, city. Um, and this came about, this being Grace. You know, Grace sits on a 23-acre campus. We took over the Gainesville Correctional Institute uh, back in 2014. And the plan for Grace, we actually wrote back in 2005, so 18 years ago at this point. And we, we came up with the plan by just asking people on the street, like, what, what do you need? 
you know, obviously we know we talk housing all the time and people said, yeah, that's great. Housing sounds awesome, but I really need a place I can put my stuff. I really need a place I can take a shower and use the bathroom without having to be in a program where I can just show up and use a urinal, you know, and that kind of like very basic needs stuff. So we started talking about what this project would look like in 2005. It, nine years later, we had spent nine, almost 10 years trying to locate it in probably five or six different communities to the point where some people in these communities were saying, I'll give you $250,000 if you don't put it here, which I, you know, if the mob was doing it, we'd call it extortion. But when a homeless shelter is doing it, we call it fundraising. Mm -hmm. But you know, at the end of the day, the, the reality was nobody gets very far by, and I tell you this from experience by showing up to a neighborhood saying, Hey, my name's John. I have an idea. We're going to launch the biggest homeless services initiative that this community has ever seen. And I want to do it right next to you. And nobody, nothing brings a neighborhood together like telling them you want to open up homeless services. So that brought us to a spot where we needed help from local government to actually find a location. And throughout that site selection process, somewhere along the way, they got word, the city commission got word that this campus was going to be closing and they made a deal with the state of Florida that they would, I think it worked out that they purchased the land for something like a million dollars and the state agreed to donate the buildings on top of it. So on one hand, that created some awesome opportunities. We, we spent almost 10 years fighting not in my backyard, not, you know, dealing with NIMBY opposition. Now I have 23 acres. We are our own backyard. We are on, for lack of a better term, kind of institution row. We're surrounded by a work release center and an airport and the fairgrounds and a mental health lockup unit and another mental health state department down the street. Like there's nobody coming shopping on Northeast 39th Avenue. So we are our own neighbors and we can build in our own on our own property now without having to deal with a lot of community opposition. That has been awesome. Like we don't have to go through a three month or a three year process of justifying our existence every single time we want to add five more shelter beds or you know expand how many meals in a day that we serve. On the other side, we have this facility that was pretty much built by the lowest bidder in 1980 and then maintained by inmates until the time it closed. So, you know, we came in here and we we sort of discovered a whole litany of problems with the place ranging from in some places like cigarette filters being used for to attempting to be used for um for breakers or for parts of a circuit box that were like had wires stuck into it we came in and had seen you know most of the outlets had been burned out from people cooking hot dogs or heating up uh coffee or hot chocolate in in uh with electrical wires being dragged out of or sticking out of the sockets the walls have some kind of insulation in them so that if you start trying to tap tap out or break through the wall, then all that insulation pours in. The trusses here have metal sheets in between them to keep people from going up into the roof and then climbing out and coming down someplace else. So while it's been awesome to have this space, what we've also figured out is none of this stuff was up to code when we got here. Um, and there, there are a particular set of challenges in dealing with like prison renovation or prison what about, construction. But what about with the city as well? I mean, because it's city property. You guys are an independent organization. Right. The city owns the police, and you know it seems to be like it's almost like a a, a yo-yo where, uh, or, or you could even call it smoke and mirrors or kabuki theater, where it's almost like it's intentionally dramatized. So whenever these politicians need to be able to get garner votes and stuff like that they send the police you know we're the brunt of it and because you're on city property you don't really get much protection <laughs> from them because it's their property well you know i i don't know that the, the, in terms of who who supports the work we do and who who doesn't support the work we do it seems to me that there's in this town, 30% or so of the population, I would say, supports what we do no matter what because we're a homeless shelter, we're doing good work, carrying that out. There's 50% of people who are kind of on the fence and sometimes they think it's really great to be providing, you know, 
perfect services for people without housing. Other times they see a lot of people panhandling and they get a little bit uncomfortable or nervous and they start to worry or wonder, is this the right thing? And those are the folks that we'll work with trying to help educate them and try to help get, get them more information. But then there's like 20% of people in the population who will just not support what we do no matter what. So, and I'm sure politicians are also aware of that. There's some element of like, oh yeah, this is, this is great work. We support this. Who could say no to providing, you know, critically needed services to the, the most vulnerable people in our community. And then there are other people who have weaponized that and said, you know, say things like, oh, housing first doesn't work. It's, you know, disregarding 20 years of scientific research that shows this is the most effective intervention we've had so far in working around homelessness. Um, and just we'll, we'll say, yeah, those, those facts don't matter to me. I'm just going to be against this. So this place, you guys were able to come across by luck. Is that pretty much... Well, but luck in a million bucks, you yeah. know, like it, which we we did not have the resources. And, and to your point earlier where you asked, you know, why isn't the city running this or why isn't the county running this? Um, first and foremost, they don't want to run this. Co counties, cities are not built to do this. We They don't have typically case managers on staff. They don't have... Um, frontline staff who can be working with whatever it is, you know, helping people in the laundry room over here, helping with maintenance over here, helping people de-escalate conflicts over here. Um, it's just not something that, that local government tends to be built to do. Um, and as a result, they have found that it's it's cheaper, more effective, and, and actually gets more done when they contract with a nonprofit that is designed to do that. So exactly like how much money are you saving the city by doing it this way versus versus doing it, um, letting them do it. I know that they have run those numbers before, and I think it turned in, I think, and this is this was five years ago, what this, the county found out was through, you know, everything from their insurance plans to risk management and all of that, that they couldn't do what we do for the same price. It would be more expensive. Um, because people, you know, people are going to make more. There's retirement plans at the county. There's... Uh, people dedicated to making sure that all risks are, are mediated to the greatest extent possible, and that costs money. So at some point, they've, they have made a decision that it makes more sense for us to be doing this. And I think that's worked out because we've, we, at this point, we've been doing this for eight years. We've gotten local, state, and national recognition as being one of the best at, at what we do, at having made dramatic reductions in homelessness, and I don't think we would have gotten there um, with a city or a county that just can't move as quickly as a nonprofit. You know, we see something needs to change. We can have that change made by the end of the day. Uh, somebody doing that at the city or the county level would have to go through, you know, untold hours of committees and then meetings with the, the city commission or the county commission. And so by the time you've recognized what the change is that needs to happen, you're already two months behind with a lot of times is what you see happen there. So if you were to give advice, you know, to somebody throughout the rest of the country or in a different country that wants to be able to set up or find some infrastructure like this to be able to offer similar services uh, for whatever their motives may be, what suggestions would you give them? So certainly starting, starting small, uh, you know, not, not looking at grace and saying, well, gosh, if we don't have uh, 23 acres and a $5 million budget and 60 employees, then we're not going to be able to do this. When we started, we, we had four services that we provided. We had an annual budget of $300,000 a year, and we paid nine employees with that money. So we have gone in the past eight years from, I mean, when we opened, we had no shelter. We provided four services. And I think what we had was information and referral, which just means we're going to tell you what other agencies you can go to for help. We provided bathrooms. We provided a place you could put your stuff. And we provided bus passes. So, but starting there, you know, we also said, we're not even sure if people need this service. They've told us that they do, but we're going we're gonna to try to set it up in a way where people really need it. And if this has been successful, we think we'll serve 100 people in our first year. Well, we opened up, and on our first day, we served 108 people. And we have used the success that we've had along the way to document and to demonstrate that we can do more. And I, I think that's a really critical piece, is, is this has so many different moving pieces to it that the more you can do to start off small, whether that's one service or a food pantry or anything else, 
then whatever you can do to grow that from there is going to be better than trying to start with all of it at once. Okay, and how would you start the fundraising process? Especially like nobody's got a couple, I mean, there's some people that have millions of dollars, but it's not like everybody. Sure, I don't know any of them, but yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, the fundraising process, we, we had to start with some local government support. We started with an existing agency too. So how do you do that? Um, we, so it's, you build relationships with people. You know, there's so much about fundraising is just trust and relationship building. And what we were able to do is we had support from the city and the county, $150,000 each. They each put up $150,000. That's not a crazy huge amount of money for local government. Um, so once we started with that, we were really, really aware of the need to demonstrate that they were getting some value for that. So we, we would say, look, you know, for every person, we're, our community itself is spending, I forgot what the most recent numbers were, but something like $5 million, $6 million a year just to arrest people and put them in jail for being homeless. You know, if they were outside and they were sleeping outside, they were peeing outside, they were drinking outside, three different things that are not illegal if you do them in your own house. We would send a cop out and that would cost $700 and we would arrest them and that would cost $500. We'd put them in jail at a cost of $125 a night. And at the end of the day, we knew we were spending more money policing homelessness than we were actually trying to solve the problem. So we tried to tap into that and say, look, for every person that we have sleeping here, we can serve them here for $60 a night. Or you can arrest them, put them in jail and spend $125 a night to actually not solve the problem, but make their problems more difficult. So we started trying to really tap into that because if there are people in the community who will be moved by just the human component of people who are suffering and now thanks to the work we're trying to do, they're suffering less. And there are other people who are completely immune to that. But when you tell them we're spending, you don't want to see these people on the street. Like if there's some common factor here, as a homeless advocate versus a person who hates homeless people, we can at least both agree that neither of us want to see homeless people on the street. I want to see them in housing. This person doesn't care where they see them. They just don't want to see them in the street. And we can talk about the cost of that. You know, like they, if they already can't stand seeing people without housing for whatever reason, well then you can figure out like, if you don't like seeing them there, you're going to really hate to hear that we're spending twice as much on them as we need to be when we could actually be providing a shelter or something for half the cost of the jail. That makes, that actually makes logical sense how this, because it's, and like, are you guys partnering with other agencies? Because in that same news article that I was reading, um, it was, it was talking about something like you guys have some sort of ties with like United Way and probably some other organizations as well. Uh, I know when I ran my business, you know, like I had to go with Home Advisor because I pay a yearly fee, they do all of my advertising, and then they send me leads, and then I would go out and bid on the jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is does the is that kind of what places like United Way, the American Red Cross, do, do play, is that kind of what they offer because they're such big organizations, or how is it that Grace is getting tied up with these larger organizations over time? So some of it, you know, depending on who we partner with is going to depend on what funding is available. And, and mostly, though, it depends on what we need to get done, because there is a, a very easy nonprofit curse to fall into where you are chasing every dollar that's available. And therefore, and, and every grant dollar has a string attached to it. So you can only do so much. And if I say, well, I need this money, so I'm going to take this money. Suddenly, you're having to do that work. And so for us, we had to be really intent on focusing on what we do well, which is helping people without housing and helping people without housing in crisis, solve that crisis and get back into housing quickly. So what that looks like in terms of partnerships, you know, we, we have partnerships on a couple different levels. So funding wise, we receive money from uh, the local continuum of care. It's a homeless umbrella organization run by United Way. We're a United Way impact partner. We receive funding from the state's Department of Children and Families, from the Veterans Administration at the federal level, from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And all of those are things that we started doing um, with small projects, and then we have built them up over time by demonstrating. If you give us $40,000, we will do 120% of what you tell us we need to get done. And therefore, if you give us $100,000, you will also be able to count on that, and we just kind of keep growing that. The other part where we're using partners, though, is 
recognizing that we're not great at everything. You know, and I see a lot of shelters try to be really, really good at 20 different things and then being great at none of those things. And what we have tried to do is really say, we're going to be great at housing people. And then, you know, healthcare, I would never be good at healthcare. So I'll bring in people to provide healthcare. Uh, mental health treatment, I will never be good at that. So I will bring in people to provide mental health treatment. Um, transportation, will never be great at just driving people all around town. It's not what we're built to do. So we can provide bus passes when we have them. We can provide other transportation assistance. And so there's partnerships as well with about a dozen different agencies where we're saying, hey, look, you are better at what we are hoping to get done here than we are. Would you come in here? We'll give you free office space. We'll provide you whatever support you need. And if you'll provide this service for our guests, we'll try to facilitate that and make it as easy as possible. So for us, there's partnerships on the, the direct service level. There's partnerships on the funding level. And then there's partnerships throughout the community as well um, that range from you know sponsorships from banks or local local businesses who want to support the work that we're doing to churches who want to be providing funding directly to feed the poor that then that money is going directly into the cafe to provide meals for people every day okay and um so you do know that this is a, a prepping channel so a couple of prepping questions sure. for you um when it comes to when it comes to the food um and and the not only the drain from the from the people needing the food but also the cost of food how is that affecting how you're able to provide services to, to us? And how is it, how are you guys seeing it long term? Because it seems like inflation is going to be here for some time. Yeah, so I mean, our food costs went up $70,000 in the last year. And, and we don't have an extra $70,000, you know. And I, I say all this as somebody who first got involved in working with people without housing by jumping into dumpsters, pulling food out, and serving it with Food Not Bombs. Like, that's kind of where I got my start. And from there, you know, to come to a spot where suddenly we're in a kitchen where we're not allowed to use expired food and we're not allowed to use stuff even from the food bank that got here a day out of date or anything like that. Um, it's always a big challenge for us to be able to do that. And, you know, what we do well is, again, we partner with the Bread of the Mighty Food Bank in this case. We have a great food bank in town who they're the ones talking to Publix and to Winn-Dixie and to the restaurants and to the university. So all of the extra food goes to the food bank and then they distribute that to us and to dozens of different nonprofits around town. Yeah, um, do you need to get back? Uh, let me see. Sorry. Hey. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I will wrap this up real quick then. Uh, or do I need to wrap it up right now? Uh, no, 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 let me see what time it is. I, I got like eight minutes. Okay, so... Um, with, with the with the cost of food and going up, why haven't you guys worked with like the city and the local government to change the laws? Because I know when I was traveling between here and Tallahassee, I would go in and say, "Hey, can I get your stuff that's about to go like at the little gas station?" Oh no, no, we can't do it. One lady helped me out, mm -hmm. knowing that she couldn't. Why haven't you guys like tried to get the laws changed so that it will actually benefit you on that on that aspect as well? Um, again, it just comes down to here's like. We don't have a lot of free time to start figuring out like we're already understaffed and underfunded for the work that we're doing and for us to take on those bigger things. Um, I don't know that it would have that much of an impact on us because we do have ready, regular steady access to food. We've also got a small garden that's coming in and, and generating some food for the cafe. Um, the food part has not been the most difficult for us. Uh, it's been the cost of housing more than anything else. Yeah, and like, I guess for every $100 it goes up, homelessness goes up by like 9%. That, that's the recent stat I've heard. Uh, what's that? That for every $100 that rent is increased, homelessness increases by 9%. Huh, I'd be really interested to see um, that. I've not no, ever heard there that. Is, uh, there's a channel out there that really advocates for homeless. It's called uh, Invisible People. It's on YouTube. I know Mark, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. He was actually where I got the stat from. I saw him actually last week. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I saw that he was in, in um, cause I, I follow the channel too. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So with, with everything that's going on economically, at least my understanding with just the way things are going to go is that the bottom 30% of people, whether it be because they don't want to comp capitulate to the new digital dollar coming this year, whether or not they, they just uh, get caught up in, in the grinder of kind of like, as we're kind of having a global economic collapse because of the, the different wars that are going on and stuff like that. 
I think that over the next couple of years, we're going to see the bottom 30% of, of people, a large majority of them, end up out here in shelters, in stuff like that. How are you able to protect them and, and, and actually provide them services without, uh, you know, without them backsliding into what we see here with the, the people that have been homeless it's for long periods of time where they get into the drug use? Because the thing is, is eventually the economy is going to recover. Eventually we'll get back up on our feet. But you gotta, you gotta be able There's to. There's an enormous human toll between now and eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, like, uh, what are you guys doing to prepare for that, or are you guys even thinking about that, even with everything that's going on? You know, it's it's really interesting, and and funding for homeless services always follows crisis, which which sucks. You know, it's it's. And you'll see it now where, like, we finally have some good best practices that we can work with. But all of that came from this explosion in unsheltered homelessness. And, and you could probably argue that this is, it has been this way since the, the early 80s when homelessness first exploded onto the national scene. And nobody gave a shit until people were sleeping in doorways and you had to pass them on your way to the coffee shop or you had to pass them on your way to work. And then people said, oh, God, let's build some homeless shelters. So at least we'll move all of these people inside and we won't have to see them anymore. And then quickly homelessness outpaced the the growth of shelters. And, and there's some recognition that shelters were never the right intervention for people without housing, that we shouldn't assume that adults who had lived privately for decades suddenly are going to do really well living in a room of 120 other adults uh, who are all in crisis. So, you know, in terms of preparation, we are basically always trying to do the best that we can with what we have. Um, some days it feels like we have enough and there are local leaders who would say, we believe in what you're doing. So now let's help you get ready for what's to come. But the reality is funding will generally follow being too late to have addressed it when it's coming and then having to deal with the aftermath of it when it's already here. Okay. Final, final question. Uh, this is your, your open mic to say whatever, close it out. If there's anything you think that we left out, any things you want to make sure to, to hit, anything like that, this is your closing remarks. You got uh, anything you want to add? You know, I, I don't think this will be a surprise to anybody watching, but you know, homelessness exists at the juncture of the spot where all of these other systems fail. And whether, depending on your politics, you could argue that these systems are broken. You could also argue that these systems are working exactly as they're designed to work. And so when we don't have adequate access to healthcare, to education, to opportunity, to jobs, to, to resources in general, then we are going to see homelessness. The primary things that have changed in recent years, though, aren't about who is homeless or who, what, how they lived before or what their moral character was or anything. You know, we have... We have spent decades in our country, at least, trying to convince people that homelessness is the result of personal failures, moral failures, character flaws, anything like that. You even see that in the way that we fund homeless services. We don't fund it as a housing problem. We fund it as a substance abuse problem. We fund it as a mental health problem. So that's where you see the primary funding for homelessness is through, oh, how do we fix what's wrong with these people? as opposed to how do we fix what's wrong with this system that consistently leads to a situation where it's not that we don't have enough units. It's that we have, in Alachua County at least, a 1,000 people on the street. We have 20,000 empty apartments. It's just that we have a system where people have chosen to leave. To, that They have decided it is better to leave those apartments sitting empty than it is to allow other human beings to come in and use that if it means they're not going to get as much money that they wanted. So... I think it's really critical to understand that homelessness is more a systemic issue than it is anything else. And until we get to this point where everybody at least has some guaranteed minimum access to housing, then we're going to continue to see this and we're going to continue to fight this fight over whether it's a systemic issue or a personal issue. But what we know is that it is a systemic issue and it's all based on if people can afford the housing that's available to them. Okay. Just out of curiosity, um, Homelessness, how is it? Are you, are you seeing a rapid increase recently or is it still the steady increase as, as usual? So we're one of the few communities that has seen homelessness fall in the past five or eight years. Since Grace opened, homelessness has decreased 47% in Alachua County. This year, and these numbers are not released yet, but we saw unsheltered homelessness go up for the first time in 
probably six or eight years. By about how much? Um, do not know yet. I would say safely we were at 300 people unsheltered last year that we knew of. And I think the number will end up going up to something like 400 or 500. So 30 to 50% That's a increase. increase. And of course, there's the question of, are there more people or this year we hired homeless folks to help us go find homeless folks. So, or did we hire more people and are they better at finding people? Um, how much of that is tied to the fact that we've had a street outreach team for the past year who have spent an entire year finding every homeless camp that they can in town. And, you know, suddenly we're in a, a spot where we had better access to knowledge and information. So it's hard to say like how much of it has gone up because there's more people and how much of it has gone up because we just got better at finding people. But we, we expect to see this continue to go up until we can have adequate amounts of housing. You know, we talk a lot about ending homelessness, but until we get to the point that it's not just stopping what we consider homelessness, it's also creating a world where we have abundant access to housing for everybody who needs it. Well, thank you for your time, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, my viewers, thank you. Say bye. So take care, y'all.